So we've got a guest today, haven't we, Stephanie? And this was one that's been personally hand-selected by you. It's Elena Kunicki. I have been following her since she was originally the binge eating dietitian on Instagram. I just love her energy and her down-to-earth sort of approach to things and her story. And I've just always been sort of drawn to her and her outlook on fitness and how to approach fitness, have fitness be part of your life when you are trying to also balance your mental health and keep everything in check from a disordered eating recovery perspective. Yes. So in this episode, we will be talking about all in recovery, restriction, losing your period, taking a break from exercise, returning to exercise. And yeah, just that idea about how to pursue fitness goals if you have or you're recovering from a disordered place. Is it a good idea? And how might you go about doing that? You can follow her on Instagram. She's Elena Kanicki RD. She also has a podcast called The Binge Eating Dietitian. We will put links to those things below. We hope you enjoy the episode. We're recording already. Oh, cool. Because I wanted to just jump in and I didn't want, I would. I wanted yeah. to say this to you anyway, mm-hmm. but I also wanted it to be recorded. That the reason I have been following you since before your account got hacked which is like my worst fear. Um, maybe not my worst, but, and I've always just been so drawn to your, you're just a refreshing down to earth, real talk person. And I (laughs) like the energy of just your transparency and your ability to just be yourself. I just think it's very relatable and inviting. So you help women get their periods back and also who are in fitness, you know, who are interested in, in fitness and having fitness goals and how to do that without compromising their physical and physical mental health, because this is somewhere you've been Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you very, very helpfully model what it's like to have a balanced life that still includes fitness, but also includes food and just joy and being able to just be yourself. So I wanted to invite you to tell your story because I don't know that I've ever heard it. For sure. Well, thank you for all those compliments. I really appreciate it. Yeah. So my story began when I was growing up and was like the chubbier friend. And obviously in our culture in UK and the US, like all Western countries, I feel like at this point are developed nations at this point, there's a lot of focus for women on our appearance and not being fat, being quote thin, like that's kind of the standard of what we're all we're all kind of conditioned to strive for. So when I hit puberty and I was kind of bigger than all my friends and started getting comments about being fat and, you know, being called fat, et cetera, et cetera. That's when I started to develop this complex of like insecurity, not feeling good enough based on my body. So many women deal with this. So that's kind of where it started. And that led to dieting, trying to lose weight through high school, not really successfully. I was never athletic or anything like that. Uh, I didn't play sports. I did dance and and gymnastics at different points in my life, but I was not an athlete. So I started trying to work out, trying to lose weight unsuccessfully. And then I hit a point where I did this like crazy cleanse, basically, where I just didn't eat anything. And that kind of switched me into this disordered mode where I realized that I could have enough, quote, discipline to literally starve myself. How old were you at this point? I was like 17. Okay. That was the beginning of what I thought of then as my fitness and weight loss journey. Because I was like, oh, I have discipline. I never felt disciplined. And I kind of shifted into, it kind of changed my whole personality. Like my friends will tell you, I'm so different than I was back then. I was more wild and crazy and uninhibited. And then I became very perfectionistic and type A and rigid and goal oriented. And I'm still like working on those tendencies outside of food and exercise and body image now. And then I started working out a ton counting my calories and just keeping that train of weight loss going, had this big transformation in my lifestyle and in my personality and in my body and got a flood of compliments from all my peers. And that's what I always wanted. That's what my little chubby girl inside my brain desperately wanted. So it was just that validation and that high of, of getting that, that snapped me into that I will do anything to keep this. And that's where it really started to spiral downwards. So I went to college. I was really afraid of gaining the freshman 15 that people talked about. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm just going to eat less and and run even more just in case I like somehow lose control at some point and end up eating more. And then I lost my period. 
which I didn't think much about. If anything, I was kind of like, oh, that must mean I'm like super fit because yeah. all my athlete friends would lose their periods. Cool. My digestion got bad. I, I developed really bad cystic acne and I was so hungry and thinking about food all the time, but just still being very rigid. And then I started binge eating that catapulted me on this four year track of struggling with binge eating. That was my main struggle. I was like, oh my God, I had all this control and now I'm losing control. And every week I would have, you guys know how it's, you just completely lose control. I felt like I would snap into another mode. I was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It was like this, I'm just becoming a different person and I forget my goals and my intentions. And I just eat everything. I would eat my roommate's food, steal food, uh, drive to multiple grocery stores. And it was just, it just got worse and worse over those four years. And with my missing period, when I went to my gynecologist, because I was never clinically underweight, as you guys know, I'm sure know as well, I was just kind of told, oh, it's no big deal. You're just super yeah. fit. Your blood work looks normal. I took the progesterone challenge where they give you progesterone and see if it induces a bleed. And I did bleed. So I definitely had hypothalamic amenorrhea, but it was just maybe not severe enough where I had no uterine lining to shed when they gave me that medication. So that to me was just affirmation that I was super healthy and I was doing everything fine. And then through those four years, I got into bodybuilding and lifting weights. And I realized that I was too extreme when I was eating so few calories and running so much, but I thought I was not being restrictive anymore when I still was. I was eating more food, tracking my macros, but in a quote unquote flexible way, it was not even slightly flexible. And I was doing less cardio, I was lifting weights, I was building muscle. And I grew to really love that and love fitness and love like strength training. Um, but the disorder was just continuing because I was so obsessed with regaining control and keeping my body small. And then finally, I was becoming a dietitian at this point. I was just continuously trying to figure out how to stop binge eating, basically. And finally, I listened to a podcast talking about hypothalamic amenorrhea, which is when you lose your period due to undereating, overexercise, and stress. And it clicked in my head that the HA, the missing period, the I, I still was struggling with digestion a lot, and the binge eating were all connected. Mm -hmm. And it was all these were all signs of restriction and undereating and overexercise, even though I thought I wasn't doing those things anymore. And I was like, well, I can't, I really can't ignore that. And yeah. I realized that I had to let go of control of my weight and eat whatever I wanted and take an exercise break. And that's what I did. And it healed everything. Wow. And how many years ago was that? That was in 2018. Yes. 2018. That's when I went quote unquote all in, or I yeah. gave myself unconditional permission to eat and went through recovery. And then did you go back to exercise at some point? Yes. Or? Yes. So I took an exercise break for, it ended up being like three months until I got, I got my first period pretty quickly. And then in HA recovery, they say, you know, you want to get three consecutive cycles before you start reincorporating exercise. And so I did that. And then I started going back to the gym. What was that like, that transition back into trying to find the healthy balance? Because you're in this really rigid state, then you you swing the other way and for many people finding that middle ground is the challenge right yeah for sure so my perspective is that when you I, I really believe in the it's it sounds in some ways like it's just another extreme but I really fully believe in the fully letting go of all food rules even for most of my clients even some health intentions, like kind of letting go of those to really just completely listen to what your body wants. And the same thing with taking an exercise break, I believe in that like radical permission stage, because I think that that helps you realize that without any rules, without any of these things that I, I think I need to do perfectly in order to just be okay and be healthy and be happy without those things, I'm actually okay. My body actually can regulate itself. And you kind of learn that and you, you experience it and you really internalize it. I made peace with my body, even though I was so hard, I was crying all the time, feeling like I was losing my identity, gaining weight rapidly. I made peace with it without exercise. And I learned to trust my body even without that. So then it was kind of just like icing on the cake. So it didn't feel like I had to be like, okay, now I have to go to the gym five days a week. And if I miss a day, oh no, I'm going to gain weight or Maybe I'm going to spiral and then I'm not going to go to the gym tomorrow and I need to be disciplined. I need to force myself. That didn't happen anymore because 
I learned to basically trust my body. That was very similar to my experience of recovery coming from that restrictive place, right? Like the binge restrict cycle where the restrict is pretty significant. I think this is a lot how a lot of us have have moved through it. But when you talk about that messy middle part for, you know, as it's commonly known, where you are gaining weight, you're eating and you don't know if you'll ever stop. You don't have that crystal ball at that point because that's where clients are, right? That's where people listening are potentially. And that's the hardest part. How did you handle that distress? Yeah. So I feel like it was three things. First, it was that I was so clear that what I was trying was not working and that I had literally tried everything possible. Because my again, my main thing was binge eating. I had read every single book, every article, worked with therapists and fitness coaches. And I had scoured the earth to figure out how to stop binge eating, tried every approach. And it was so clear to me that that was not working and that it was all still the, the one common denominator that I was continuing through all the approaches was I was still trying to control food and my weight. I wasn't letting my body do what it wanted. I was still trying to control those two factors. So I saw that clearly and that helped me surrender in the process to just being like, I don't know, this is scary as hell, but I've tried everything else. And this is the only thing I haven't tried. And then the second thing is I just think the ev- like n- understanding the evidence and like the science behind it was really helpful for me too. Of course, and this happens with my clients too, there's always that like, well, what if I'm the one person the one person that this doesn't work for? That's what everybody thinks. But that ev- the science behind it gives you a lot of peace. The science on how the more you restrict, your leptin decreases and your ghrelin increases and your body literally it makes you think more about food and require more food to feel satisfied to try to compensate for the restriction. And that the more you listen to that and allow it, those hunger hormones can regulate. And then, you know, you'll feel less hunger and less cravings like and other things, too. But things like that were helpful for me. And then I forgot what the third thing I was going to say was. Oh, other people's stories, hearing other people's stories of just being like, okay, other people have done this. It's worked for them. That was helpful. But of course, like really I have on my wall here, surrender trust, because these are like things that I need to remember in all aspects of life. When you surrender to something because you just feel like you've run out of options, then you actually see it in motion. Then you build that trust. Like, I don't think you really trust it in the beginning ever. So have you coached a few people, or I don't know if you would use the word coach because you're a dietitian, right? What would be the longest you've seen somebody in that stage of what feels like compulsive eating? Because that's what it feels like when you first let go, right? It feels compulsive for that Mm -hmm. to taper off. All my clients go through this and I've been doing this for four years. So I've seen a lot of women go through it. I know specifically the client, she uh, has an episode on my podcast where she talks about it. Her name's Amanda. And she took about nine months for that extreme hunger to really feel like it was going back to normal. And that was the longest. She was more of an outlier among my clients. For most of them, it gets most intense within the first month, in the first few weeks. Some of my clients, the first week or two, they're like, am I binging? Like, I can't even tell if this is binging or this is just me giving myself unconditional permission to eat. It's so much food. I'm so full. I'm so hungry. The extremeness of in the beginning decreases over the first three months, but then you really find even a year in people are still finding like, oh, I'm realizing now I don't really like this food anymore that I used to love. There's kind of a slow tapering, if that makes sense. It does. And can you, you just hit on something and I want to actually, eventually, I want to get to how you've been able to have fitness in your life, including fitness goals without being disordered around it. But before we do, you just said something that's just so important. I saw a post that you had put up about it. I think this week, the di- and this is the biggest thing, the difference between unconditional permission to eat and permission to binge. Can mm-hmm. you speak to that? I think when you binge, at least the binge eating that I experienced and I work with clients who deal with this, it's, you're not actually giving yourself permission. You snap in, you have to basically snap into this other part of your brain that just is saying F it to all of your physique goals and your perfectionist list around how you need to behave around food. You basically just have to tune out that part of your prefrontal cortex or whatever and just snap into your animal brain and just be like, okay, like, it. Sorry. I don't know if I can curse on your podcast. You could edit that out, but yeah, you're not actually giving yourself permission. You're just kind of pushing that away so that you can do this thing that you, you know, and think is bad versus when you're giving yourself unconditional permission to eat, it's a decision. I'm going through this recovery process. I'm going to let go of control of my weight and food for a while. And I'm just going to let my body do what it wants. And it's intentional. 
You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes, I do. I think that's often misconceived. What did you do with the part of you that still wanted that praise and validation? I allowed that part to be there because I think we all want that. That's normal as social creatures to want praise and validation. But even the act of doing this, taking this step that I knew was going to lead to weight gain, I was like, of course, I'm going to gain weight. If I'm letting go of all my food rules and taking an exercise break, I'm going to lose muscle. My body's going to look different. I was very aware that that was going to happen. And I talked to my clients about this too. Sometimes you need to just, you need to take the actions, even when your brain is still really afraid of what people are going to think. Once my clients start taking these steps, and it was the same for me, you're starting to think about, well, people are going to think I let myself go. I don't want to see people with how my body is changing. But you do it anyways, because you're starting to attach to this higher value of, I can't live this way anymore. And this is not in line with my definition of health and my long-term vision of my life. And so that action in and of itself starts to restructure the way you prioritize other people's validation over your own needs. And that's the hallmark of eating disorders, right? It's other people's wants and needs and desires and perceptions of me take precedence over my own needs. And so you're starting to actually take those actions and then that starts to shift your thinking but then I also think a lot of mindfulness. I started meditating and journaling a lot when I started recovery. Now I see the value and this is helping me so much personally now with my own anxiety and perfectionism. And I know, Stephanie, you talk about this a lot, nervous system regulation, working through physically those emotions that are coming up when you're thinking about what people are going to think about you, journaling through the thoughts, creating reframed thoughts, all that stuff was yeah. useful for me. And Elena, I'm noticing the sign behind you that says, did I live? Did I love? Did I matter? And I think that last question about do we matter is such a, maybe even a primal innate part of being a human being. And often validation or seeking approval is a way of trying to feel like we matter. So I was mm. looking at that and also wondering whether your work gives you some of that. Just, I mean, I'm totally projecting here because mine does. Mine gives me a sense of, oh, I matter and what I do matters. Yeah. No, absolutely. It definitely does. And I've seen because I started my business right after I recovered from my own disordered eating. And then I saw that same pattern with my disordered eating playing out with my business parallels, literal yes. parallels. <laughs> We've talked so, about this. It's whack-a-mole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is whack-a-mole. So what are the values that you have now as around like the way you, you had mentioned earlier, you start to prioritize the way you want your life to look and the way you want to live. What is that for you now? It's a big question, but I feel like some of the things that get sacrificed when you are in the disordered eating is a big thing is social connection. Like you're just going to prioritize your rigid, for me at least, like your rigid schedule, eating, exercise schedule over, it prevents you from being spontaneous and and being able to spend time and energy doing things that don't involve those things or might you know, mean you stay up a little bit later, or maybe you don't feel such a pep in your step to work out the next day. Social connection, that's a value that was more abandoned back then that then became more prioritized. Just like a general sense of peace, that could be a value because it was more before. It, and again, I'm still working through this in other areas, but it was willpower and discipline my way through everything. And that's important and valuable, but to what end? If you just end the day feeling exhausted and depressed because all you did was check everything off your to-do list and reach, reach all your goals, but you had no fun. I guess fun, yeah, like fun, fun yeah. peace. Yeah, fun. Fun's a huge one. Fun, peace, social connection, exploration, and like seeing the world. You can't do that when you have such a rigid eating schedule. Travel is so hard for, as you guys know, like when you're going through disordered eating. So I would say those are some of the values. Can you talk to us about how you see fitness, including fitness goals? So I think there can be a black and white way of thinking of it has to be joyful movement, which is only spontaneous and never planned and never structured and doesn't have goals. That can be a misconception of how to make peace with exercise. Can you mm -hmm. speak to how to have the goals you have and fitness as part of your life without it becoming extreme or yeah. compromising. 
fitness goals and physique goals are two separate things and people combine them together, but they're separate. That's the first thing you have to separate fitness from how your body looks, which is very difficult to do. And you can't fully separate them because strength training, it changes how your body looks. If you do it consistently, like it does, it, you will build more muscle and it will change how your body looks and you'll have feelings about that. First, you have to separate those two things. That's important. So when I went back to exercise, and this is what I recommend to my clients too, it was about performance and strength and like what my body can do. How strong can I get? How much can I deadlift? Can I build up to doing pull-ups again? How much can I squat? That should be the priority, the main way you approach fitness. In terms of it being healthy, what's going to lead to the healthiest mindset around fitness, that should be higher priority than physique. And even above that, it's health and well-being and mindset and your mental health. I feel like it comes down to motivations for fitness and then having kind of guardrails um, to help you not have it become a disordered thing again. Um, so, yeah. Like what, what parts of that would you like me to go deeper into? Cause I just feel like it's a big topic. Yeah. Your guardrails. Like how do you keep your guardrails? What are they for you? So for me, it's that my mental and physical health always come first. And that includes if my body needs rest, I'm going to just rest. I'm not going to like push through and do another workout. It means that I'm always prioritizing. Like I've been doing CrossFit lately, which is very intense exercise. And whereas before I would do these intense workouts and then be limiting my calories. Now I'm like, okay, that was an intense work. I need to make sure I'm eating a lot of carbs. I grabbed a Gatorade right when I got home, even though that's not the healthiest thing on the, on the planet, because I'm like, I need carbs right now. And I'm going to make sure I'm eating plenty of food throughout the day. So yeah, that's one example. Another example would be, I may have a desire to have my glutes look a certain way or have my body look a certain way. But if pursuing that goal would take away from any aspect of my definition of health, then I'm just not going to do it. So for instance, I posted about this, having big glutes, that's part of an aesthetic that certain people have, right? That's part of an aesthetic that I, I like, but in CrossFit, you're not as much paying attention to your glutes. So am I going to go to the gym and do more glute work in addition to CrossFit? Maybe sometimes I will, but other times I will not because I would rather I would rather go out with my friends or sleep in if that's what I need to, or take a rest day than force myself to do that in order to keep my body looking a certain way. Yeah. So yeah, you have to have a very clear definition of what mental and physical well-being looks like to you on a holistic level, including your fulfillment in life. And then anything related to fitness or your physique is going to take away from that in order to pursue it. It has to be a hard no. Do you think there are any people out there who have struggled with a poor relationship with exercise, compulsive exercise, disordered eating, for whom any kind of intensive exercise could always trigger them back? Do you think some people end up in that situation? I think some people do. It's not as much like, I would say I'm not as knowledgeable on especially like exercise addiction. I have worked with some clients who are falling into that category where it's quite literally like the high of it. It, it becomes more than just what I experienced or what most of my clients experienced where you're very attached to it. It's like you get this, it's like a hot, it's like a drug almost. And I see that, I've seen that more in my clients who've struggled with bulimia. Just, I mean, I don't know what the research says on that, but that's just something that I've noticed. And I've seen that happen with them where when they go back, um, the intensity can kind of pull them in and they'll start doing more and more. However, what I will say, and this is just in my own clients, is Sometimes I wonder if those people just haven't really fully healed yet, you know, but then I wonder, is full healing really possible? I don't know. That's just my honest thoughts. So I don't know. That's a really depressing thing to say. What are your guys' perspectives <laughs> no, on that? No, we've talked about that, you know, about like, is that even a thing? And I, I might think of it as, as there are certain triggers for some people that can always be hit, that that's yeah. just there. And I know for me... So if I do very intensive exercise, I struggle to regulate my appetite if it's too mm -hmm. intensive because I feel like I can't, I can't quite get enough energy in from what mm -hmm. I feel like I need. And I just, yeah, it can actually set me off a bit. So by which I mean, I could do something like a, maybe a 45 minute spin class or something like that. But if I go and do even something like body pump, specifically if I combine cardio and strength, 
I don't, I find that that sends just something haywire in my capacity to regulate. I also don't like it as a combination, which obviously helps. But yeah. those two together, for some reason, like my, I just, it doesn't feel good for me. Yeah. And everyone's body is so different. And there's also, I feel like different seasons of life too. And like your body changes and different things work for you. I'm in a season right now where I'm starting to do more intense exercise like that, which I didn't do like since I, since I recovered, I hadn't really done that and it didn't feel good, but now it is. But I just think all of our bodies are different. And I feel like what you're describing is different from somebody who's like, what I've seen in my clients who feel that compulsive exercise, it's, it just gives them this high that's connected with how their body looks and how they feel. But maybe there's like a low dopamine state occurring just generally with them. And that's, you know what I'm I really, I don't know. Also, I mean, if there hasn't been work on the perfectionistic thinking, that that yeah. could always override all the best attempts in the world to try and moderate exercise. So there's obviously these wider themes as well that come out through food and exercise, which I just wondered if you bumped up against it, because some of that stuff might feel like beyond your scope of what you would be able yeah. to do with a client. Yeah, some of it is beyond my scope. And I think also, like, you know, you mentioned earlier, how do you find that balance? And the perfectionism aspect of exercise. And I still feel that I will still, I, I can feel that little anxiety bubbling up. If maybe like I haven't worked out in a few days or definitely something that will still come up with, with me is feeling like I'm being unhealthy or I'm being lazy. Th those are things that will trigger me a little bit. And I'll start to feel a little low mood or a little bit conflicted. Like maybe I should, maybe I should do this. Maybe I shouldn't. Or if I get off my routine, it's again, parallel to my eating disorder. If I just get off my routine with just work, I kind of feel like I'm on fire, like everything's just not good, but that's a little dramatic, but I'm mm. learning how to work through that. And I feel like with the exercise piece, it's just kind of reminding myself that nothing terrible is going to happen in either direction. Whereas before it seemed like something terrible was going to happen if I didn't work out or I was going to spiral and become lazy and sedentary or whatever those things mean um, versus now I kind of just breathe and I'm like, you're going to be fine. Nothing's going to happen either way, in either direction, whatever decision you make, whether you choose to exercise and maybe you overdid a little bit, that's just information for you now to know that, oh, when I feel like this, I actually need to rest. Or maybe you will rest and realize that you would have felt better if you worked out. That's just information now for you to take into next time. So I try to see it as an ex like experiments and learning, you know? Yeah. So when you're helping people through the all in process and you're suggesting they take an exercise break, where would you cap that sort of from a movement perspective? What advice do you give to people? So I'm assuming it's not going to be, oh, don't do any walking. People can go yeah. for walks and that kind of thing. But where would you advise people sort of look to put that line while mm -hmm. in the all in recovery stage? Yeah. So what I tell them is you're taking a break from structured exercise. So like we're not planning it into the schedule typically. And this is also nuanced for the person. So it's really, it is different person to person, but generally it's like, you're not going to the gym. You're not going for a run. You're not doing more intense exercise and you're not like pre-planning it. Like I'm going to do this on this day. Like I have to do this as part of my schedule. Um, and, and definitely if someone's lost their period, it's like, even if you felt like you wanted to do it genuinely, you're not going to do it because you need to, you need to rest and you're not going to do, you know, strength training or running or more intense exercise. And then where it gets fuzzy is like, if you want to walk, if you want to stretch, if you have the genuine desire to do that, then go do it. But what's hard is distinguishing between that genuine desire to do it versus what I was just describing of, oh, I feel lazy. I feel like I need to move. I feel like I'm going to gain too much weight. I'm being unhealthy. So that is the gray area where we need to start to distinguish between if this wouldn't change your body at all, would you still want to do it? If this would burn no calories, would you still want to do it? When in doubt, when you're unsure if this is just like a guilt fueled thing or not then just allow yourself to do nothing. And if you really are itching to move, then go do it. And then you kind of learn. For me, I didn't want to walk at all in the beginning. And a lot of my clients, they don't, because I would also, they tend to force themselves to hit step counts and stuff like that. So even walking becomes tainted. Perfectionistic. Do you ever have clients who are like, okay, I'm going to stop doing stuff. I'm going to be on the couch more. And then when it's time to reintegrate. They're like, no, I don't, 
want to because I'm afraid of it or I'm afraid I'm going to become perfectionistic. Or are you working with people who are more like this is a lifestyle? Most of my clients, it's more like this is a lifestyle. So fitness has become so much part of their life that it's just like, oh, of course I'm going to go back. But I have worked with clients. I have, I've also worked with clients in the fitness space who are afraid, like you're describing. And I've also worked with clients who are just, it takes them a while longer to really want to exercise again. Or I've worked with clients who maybe they're just like burnt out in their life overall. Work is really intense. Um, they just don't feel a lot of motivation, but physically they're cleared to exercise again. And they kind of want to do it because they feel like it's good for their health. They feel like it would make them feel better, but they don't have that much motivation to do it. And so we might actually set intentional goals to start doing a little bit here and there and finding the time and energy for it and seeing how it makes them feel. But yeah, I've had some clients be a little afraid. They're afraid basically that their that eating disorder brain is going to be triggered. And it, right. it typically is in some way, shape or form. And I'm just like, we can work through that. It's not like it doesn't have to spiral. Typically, the the two ways it's triggered in the beginning is body image, like you're looking in the mirror at the gym, and you look so different. Yeah. And you feel like a different person and you're in this environment, but you feel completely different. That's really hard. You feel like you're so much weaker and that's really hard. And all these negative thoughts come in. And then once your body, once you start to get into it and you're seeing your body change, there's a risk of you attaching to that and then being like, okay, let me like move yep. this along. Let me start, you know, eating a little bit less. And so we're just aware of that and then being open and aware of those thoughts and not yeah. acting I don't think you reach a point where those things wouldn't, I don't, you know what I mean? I think sometimes I think I have a couple of clients where I feel like are waiting to get to a point where all those things you just mentioned are going to be a non-issue. Like probably yeah. you're going to have a reaction when you see your body in the mirror that looks different or, you know, all of that. And to, I think it's so much more pro productive to say like, oh, we're going to expect that to happen and yeah. we're going to work with that. You know yeah. what I mean? Without letting it, it doesn't mean it's going to become what it was. We just have to stay on top of it. For sure. Yeah. And you get, you get like, you build mental strength and the muscle of self-compassion as you work through that and you like meet those difficult feelings and thoughts and move through them. It just makes you more strong, you know? Yep. That's part of that muscle. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> what do you get from exercise? Like what, in what ways is it? motivating to you to do it? What do you get from it? That's not aesthetic. So at this point, the big difference from before during my disorder eating to now is the way that it, it improves my mood is like the main thing. Um, whereas before I would have said it helps my mood, but really it just like helped quiet the thoughts of I'm going to gain weight and just made me feel like I'm, you know, on track for my physique goals. But now it's just like, it just brightens me up and improves my mood and my mental health. So I feel like mental health overall, just confidence in what my body can do, like the confidence in building a skill physically, it just ripples to my confidence in other areas. Um, I just find it really fun. I didn't find it. I, I found it fun in the beginning when I first started exercising, but then once you're under eating and over exercising, it's just not fun anymore. It's your body is screaming at you to not be doing it. So it becomes something you dread. And now it's just like, I can't wait to do it because it's fun. And the feeling after is great. So yeah. And I mean, any aesthetic changes are really like icing on the cake, but I want to speak to this for a second too, because I have two minds about this. On the one hand, I, I kind of, I feel gross talking about physique goals because I feel that the reasons why we want to look a certain way are so just conditioned into us and don't matter. It really doesn't matter. And I hate that our society is so focused on that. And I think it's causing so many problems. I think that it's also probably, it's probably just natural in some way, I guess, for humans to care about how their bodies look. But then I'm like, is it? I don't know. Would we <laughs> in like tribal times? Like I really don't. So that whole thing, I have all these different thoughts about that. And then on the other hand, I know that everyone does care about how they look like it's just everyone does now so we can't avoid that and people are going to have that desire and I have I have thoughts personally about my own body of course but I just think that we need to really put it in its place in the scale of what matters in life 
And so I'll have all those thoughts of, you know, if someone compliments my body because I'm like, oh, has my body changed? Like, oh, you know, th there will be that little part of my brain that's like, okay, you got to keep doing what you're doing then. And then I'll say, no, we don't. We're going to okay. do what is in line with our values of health and fulfillment in life. And you are going to let your body look however it needs to look when you're doing those things. And if you want to like do some hip thrusts to build up your glutes, sure. But even that is going to be put in its rightful place in the, in the scale of what matters, yes. you know? Yes. So it's a complicated subject. No, I totally resonate with that. I think you do a good job of showing people how to work through those moments. Like you, again, you model that by acknowledging that you have thoughts too. It's not about not having those thoughts, but you seem to like to have to have this constant level of awareness of how to check them, you know? Yeah. And that's part of the, I think the maintenance of recovery. Yeah. And I can say, I'll let my body look however it wants to look because I did that. Like I did, I completely let go of any intention for how my body looked and not controlling it. And I would not have, I believe I would not have gotten to that mindset if I didn't go through the full exercise break, the full permission to eat. Like that allowed me to, I, I truly was like, I will accept my body however it needs to look. And I'm not going to try to change it. I wasn't like, oh, and then I'll lose fat later. No, I was just like, I'm going to let it look however it needs to look. And I made peace with that. And so I really believe in that, in the recovery process. It's very hard to do for some people harder than others, but it's possible and it just makes everything better. Yeah. That was what I did as well. And that I gave myself a year of abandoning those goals and that, and had, having that surrender because it, it, it gives me that like, no, I've been there. I've done that. Like it, I can, I know I can do that. It gives you the evidence that you can reach that place in your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long did it take you, Steph, for, to, for you to feel your appetite regulated a bit more? Nine months. Mm. Yeah, it was one of the longer. So, I mean, I wasn't like, a, I mean, the first three months I was in that phase of compulsive eating really a lot up to almost six months, but it started to taper after three months down. And then by nine months, it was pretty regulated. And then I brought exercise back. If there was someone listening to this, Elena, who's where you were before you started this process, what would you want to say to them? What would have been helpful for you to have known ahead of time? Mm -hmm. I would say you're sacrificing your entire life just to look a certain way. And it's, it's dumb. No offense. Like <laughs> that's, that's mean. That's, that's, that's what I would say. Obviously I'm talking to like myself, so I'm, I'm giving some tough love, but like, look at the grit. Think about your 80 year old self on your deathbed. Look back on how you're living your life and really understand like, cause I don't even think I would have understood. I didn't understand at the time. I thought I was like, oh, I'm just being healthy. I'm just, you know, being like a disciplined person who prioritizes goals and how our body looks. That's just, that's how you achieve happiness. Like I thought that's how I was achieving happiness. So I would say, look at what's actually happening in your life. All you do is exercise, meal prep, eat do work, go to sleep. You're so stressed all the time. You can't be spontaneous. Think about your 80 year old self and looking back on your life, how you would really want to have spent your time. What you're doing is not in alignment with that. And it's just not worth it. And there's so much more to life than how your body looks. And you can be happy, healthy, successful, so much more joy and love and fun in your life by just like letting your body be what it is when you're prioritizing those values and you, that will be much better. <laughs> That's what I would say. That will be much better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Elena. Yeah. Thank Thanks you for guys. coming on and we will link in the show notes where you can find Elena, both on social media and on her website. And let us know if you have any questions about this episode. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Elena.